Hello, everybody, and welcome to this conversation with the Global Fund for Widows. I am Veena Kanke, Director of Grants and Partnerships at Dining for Women, and I am joined today by Heather Leathers, who is speaking to us from New York, from Manhattan, the Hamptons, wherever you are hungering down for COVID. <laughs> so Heather, you have a presentation to share with us. Go right in. Thank you so much. And first of all, I just wanted to thank Dining for Women for your incredible generosity and for this opportunity to fund uh, banking of widows in Kenya. Um, I'm excited to share the project, but I wanted to spend a few moments talking about the issue of widowhood because it's not very well understood on the side of the pond. Um, there are about 300 million widows in the world, of which over half live in abject poverty as a direct result of their widowhood. The reason is that widows endure three main forms of human rights violations. The first is what we call disinheritance. Widows in the developing world or women tend to not be married officially. There's no legal documentation. It's usually a customary marriage. So when the husband dies, he is... <laughs> When the husband dies, he is, um, the, his family runs out and collects the death certificate and returns to the widow and says, who are you? What are you doing here? And so they evict her from her marital home, usually taking everything. Um, with that disinheritance, she loses all of the household income. She loses access to providing basic needs. And it's important to note that unlike here, Widows in the developing world tend to be young. In fact, in Tanzania, 100% of my widows were widowed under the age of 39, and they're responsible for an average of five children. In Kenya, the same. And so widows tend to have a great responsibility of educating their children, providing for their children. And with this disinheritance, they have none of the above. They're also discriminated against institutionally. The courts are biased, police forces are biased, they're unable to access economic opportunity or decent work. And that's almost 90% of widows. And then they also experience harmful traditional practices. These are violent practices that are meant to cleanse the widow of the sin of her husband's death. These are usually rape, sexual violence. They have to be unprotected. We are hearing that widows need to pay for the privilege of being cleansed. And now we're also hearing stories about their children being murdered as a result of the cleansing rites and that um, you know, various other forms of violence are being perpetrated against them. So what does this mean? Well, widows, without addressing the issue of widowhood, we're really unable to achieve the SDGs. And we've created this tragic SDG linkage chart to show the intersectionalities. But truly what we're finding is that because widows are disinherited and discriminated against and endure these harmful traditional practices, they're unable to move forward and they're, it's ubiquitous. And so what Global Fund for Widows has done, I'm a self uh, pro uh, proclaimed uh, finance geek. Uh, I was on Wall Street for 16 years and I covered banks. I studied banks. I love banks. I'm a bank geek. And so what I decided to do is start building banks for widows. And we innovated our own bank, which we call the Widows Savings and Loan Association, or a WASALA for short. And essentially, the idea is very simple. We organize widows in groups of 25 and we ask them to save a certain amount of money, usually what it is a third of what it costs to start a small business. When the widows save that one third, we then provide with a capital injection to them another two thirds. So for every dollar they invest in the bank, Global Fund for Widows gives them two. And with respect to our project that we're working with, with Dining for Women, we will be using Dining for Women's funds to offer that two for one match. The widow is immediately well capitalized and is, un, is now able to go out immediately and borrow the $100 or $150 that she needs in order to start her own micro enterprise. And so we're economically empowering widows. They own their own bank. They manage their own bank. They're self-sufficient. It's a permanent pool of capital that continues to grow. When they pay their loans back, they're essentially paying themselves back. And every time they have successful profits in their own micro enterprises, they bring those profits back to the bank 
purchase more shares and add to the bank's capital so that everyone else can grow as well. And so when in Kenya, our project is called the Brook Bank, and we are looking forward to partnering with Dining for Women in order to be able to economically empower these 350 widows through the establishment of 14 Brook Banks in Kenya. Wow. Thank you so much, Heather, for this uh, presentation. Um, Heather and I were talking before we started recording this Zoom conversation. And actually, we both have a commonality in our personal lives. And it's actually widowhood and banks. Uh, my father used to work for the Bank of India in Mumbai, India. And when my mother was widowed at 28 years of age, I was four, my oldest sister was seven the bank came through by giving my mother a job. So the bank did save us, save our family. Um, my grandmother, maternal grandmother, who was also a widow, lived with us. And I was surrounded, fortunately, by strong women in my family and community. But it was not easy growing up in a community that would question how can an all-woman household survive. It took me coming to the United States for graduate school at age 23 to the University of California, Davis. Hello to all the chapters of Sacramento and Davis. Um, for me to realize that I had grown up in a feminist household. And I wanted to make sure that we reiterate that sometimes these issues might bring out other strengths in the families that are impacted. Uh, a major professor of mine, um, you know, kind of stereotyped me, student from India, blah, blah, blah. He's, he said, jump. He thought I would say how high. Instead, I said, mm -mm, I'm not jumping. And that was such a moment for me to realize, okay, what I had been through growing up had given me strength, resilience, a different way of seeing the world, and a way to not really fall into certain predictable patterns of behavior. Um, Heather, you have similar story. Tell us about it. Thank you so much, Vina. And it's, it's truly rare to find people who are willing to talk about their personal experience. So thank you and thank you for the resilience. And I indeed agree. Um, my story is that my grandmother uh, was the inspiration for Global Fund for Widows. When she died, I was pregnant with two, with my second, and I needed a staff of seven in order to manage one child. Um, and, and I just couldn't, I couldn't imagine how, what she had to go through when she became a widow. She had debt because my grandfather was very ill. She, uh, and she was trying to, to, you know, pay for his med medication and, and treatment. But when he, when he died, um, his brothers and the family came in and basically disinherited her. Uh, she lost even things that had been given to her and brought into the marriage, like apartments and land. And she went from being very wealthy to impoverished overnight. With that, she had to make the decision of which child to educate. And she had three boys and the final was the daughter, so four children. She had to remove them from school and decide that the only one that she could afford to educate was the oldest son, who in hopes would provide for the rest of the family, which he did to the best of his ability. Um, the thing is, is that the younger two sons, the middle two sons, unfortunately did not have the same uh, opportunities in education and went on to live very difficult lives. My mother, the youngest, really found resiliency. She ended up understanding about herself that she wanted better for her life. And so she uh, loved fashion as a teenager and was growing up in this fashionable world and decided she was going to start making clothes. And she joined up with a Greek seamstress in Alexandria, Egypt, and began learning the trade and ultimately met her husband through the trade and ended up deciding that they would start new lives in the United States and were able to immigrate and come here. And part of that was because she just had that desire, that, that willingness to take risks, where I think had she not been um, a child of a widow, she might not have had the need or the impetus to. And again, what she what she did was really truly remarkable, courageous, and I feel um, resilient, uh, just like you, Vina. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I know that 
this is not unique only to families that have experienced widowhood, but even in the United States, we have a lot of families that are, you know, single parents. And so for children who experience these kinds of vulnerabilities, there are lessons to be learned that can hold us well in our futures. But uh, your organization has been doing remarkable work to kind of change the legal landscape for widows, especially in developing countries. Tell us more about your work at the UN. So we have uh, no uh, resolutions whatsoever at the United Nations that address the issue of widowhood. In fact, even in the Security Council, the resolutions which deal with widows in the context of conflict never even mention the word widow. And so we have spent the last four or five years advocating at the United Nations, especially at the Commission on the Status of Women, to meet with ambassadors, to educate them on the issues. When we share with them the numbers, when we share with them the results of our banks and what it's doing to the landscape and changing societies, um, they are impressed and then they begin to incorporate the issue of widowhood within documentation. So we've been able to start building a body of language, especially with the Commission on Status of Women and the agreed conclusions. But we're also now working with the CEDAW in Geneva. We're working with the Human Rights Council. I present to the president of the Security Council every month on the issue of widowhood and we're making strong inroads there. We were able to put together a body of evidence of 47 widows to present uh, testimonies uh, from around the world. And we're shocking the world with these stories and really, really drumming up awareness. Um, so these are all positive advancements that weren't even there maybe two or three years ago. And we're proud of the work that we're doing. We're always looking for support. So we would love for Dining for Women, anyone who would be interested in joining, uh, you know, to come to our websites, follow us on Facebook uh, or Instagram. Um, sign up for our newsletter, sign up for our emails. We would love to be able to share, uh, share and, and, and seek your help and guidance in supporting this cause at the UN. Absolutely. This is so impressive. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is Kenya, the population that the grant is going to be working on actually does have laws to protect the widows, right? but it is not knowing that the laws exist or it's the implementation of the laws. So just having a law is not perfect. Yes. Most countries will have some form of a law, but exactly as you put it, in fact, we would consider most countries in the developing world to have three sets of laws. One is the secular law, one is the religious law, and the law that actually rules the roost is the customary law. And that is the law that's of the villages. It's the law that's upheld by the chiefs and the, the uh, princes or the queens or the kings, depending on what part of uh, Africa you're in or, or Asia, but no one will ever, ever go against their chief. So they will break secular law for any reason, but they will not go against their chief. And so you sometimes have conflating laws that actually muddle the, uh, muddle the issues for widows. But again, Kenya does have laws. We've been working with our partner for the last two years to implement what are now eight laws that are going into effect. Uh, our partner has been really empowered and she has been, we've been working on building banks. So they have 30 banks in Kenya now. Um, and they're, they're now becoming fully aware. There's a meeting that happened even last week where they had four or five ministers around the table discussing widowhood. These are massive colossal paradigm shifts that we couldn't have envisioned even a year ago. And so we're grateful for the awareness to the laws and the willingness of the um, government to uh, begin implementing and, and for chiefs and, and local leaders to start implementing it as well. So this is such a wonderful example about how to transform the lives for women and girls. We have to work at the legal angles. We have to work at the national levels. We have to work at, but we also have to work at the family level, right? To change people's perceptions um, and to change the way widows are treated and accepted and the stereotypes and single parents for, for all that. Uh, in the really short half minute that I have left, uh, Heather, do you want to talk about the story about COVID and how you have been trying to feed your widows during this time? Yes, thank you so much. When when we uh, when COVID started, we had um, we knew that there would be. Uh, 
danger for widows to meet because in order to implement a bank, widows have to meet in groups of 25. And so we asked them to pause even before their governments themselves asked them to pause and implemented lockdowns. And then within two weeks of lockdowns, again, because widows have been uh, disinherited, don't have land, don't have resources, lost their jobs, we started hearing the calls for hunger. And widows often, again, young with no resources and needing to feed large families, um, began sharing with us horrifying stories of hunger and of uh, pressures for human trafficking. And so we launched the Feed Today, Eat Tomorrow campaign. And so far we've been blessed to have been able to feed some three and a half million meals throughout Kenya, India, and Cameroon. But in addition to feeding them today, we've been able to give them chickens, and roosters in order to be able for those families to start small income generating product projects in order to be able to feed or eat tomorrow as well. And so we've been proud of that uh, initiative. Um, hopefully that is coming to an end so we can get onto the business of building banks. But we've been very blessed and very proud that we've been able to um, pivot quickly address the needs of our widows. And in fact, uh, the government of India has been working with us in distribution, but the program has been so wildly successful that the Kenyan government has been watching us and decided to implement the same program in Kenya. And so we've actually inspired the Kenyan government to do things that, you know, we had been doing, um, you know, as a result of a response. It was quite a surreal moment and, and quite exciting. And we're very grateful for the opportunity. Heather, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story of widows and banks. It hit home for me. Both <laughs> Heather and I had our tissues nearby because neither <laughs> of us wanted to be emotional as we shared these stories with all of you. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation uh, about the Global Fund for Widows and we look forward to hearing more about their projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.